I'm Allison Fujito, violinist with the Pittsburgh Symphony, and this is Violin Rehab, Episode 2. Now, many of you are here watching this video because, like me, you had an injury that forced you to stop playing for a while, and now we need to go back to the basics to get our playing up to speed. And many of you haven't been injured, thankfully, and you're here because you want to go back to the basics, and as violinists, that makes perfect sense because we we need to go back to the basics pretty often, right? So I warmed up with my favorite microwavable heating pad collar. I'll even link in the description, if not for this exact one. I don't know if they're still even making it, but I know they make similar ones. And I've also done some gentle stretches getting ready for this. And I suggest that if you are healing from an injury, you do that before every practice session. Now, for most people, the physical therapists seem to agree that it's important to stretch after you exercise, and we need to do that too. We all know that playing the violin is definitely exercise for our arms, for our hands, for our shoulders. Um, but for those of us with injuries, it's also really important to stretch gently before practicing. Um, especially if it's been a while since you've really practiced because you might have lost some range of motion. So let's get to talking about shifting. Now the basic mechanics of shifting are actually quite simple. You want to go from point A to point B. You want to get there accurately. You want to get there smoothly with a minimum of shifting noise, unless you actually want some shifting noise. Noise sounds kind of negative. If you want it for expressive, expressive purposes, if you want a glissando effect. Otherwise, it's just point A to point B. So simple, right? Um, yeah, it is simple, but there are a lot of other things to consider. So in addition to the general geographic location of point A where we're starting from and point B where we're ending up, there's also the question of which finger are we shifting from and which finger are we shifting to? Are they the same? Are they different? Are they even both on the same string? And after you land, what about your other fingers? What do they need to do? Did you land in a position where they can actually do what they need to do? So there's actually quite a lot to consider, but before we delve into all of that, let's look into the most basic mechanics of it. Now I have here in my music stand, Sevchik Opus 8, and I'll put a link in the comments. You can download it and follow along with me. We're going to look at the first four exercises starting with exercise number one, which is on page two. In exercise number one, we have a one measure semi-melodic pattern. It's not really a melody. It's not supposed to sound like a melody. Don't expect it to sound like a melody. That's my dog, Charlotte. I don't know if you can hear her snoring. She snores. Um, where was I? Melody. It, it's sort of semi-melodic, but it's not really a melody. So don't expect it to end sounding like an ending. It's, it's kind of random pitches based on what the key signature is. And the, in this pattern that we have, um, every exercise has a one measure semi-melodic pattern. And in this first exercise, we shift up one position. So we start in first position, shift up to second position and then shift back down to the original position. And in the process, within each measure, we use all four fingers. So I want you to look at the, right at the beginning of the first measure where it says string and then the Roman numeral, numeral four, followed by a whole bunch of dashes. That actually means fourth string or G string. It does not mean fourth position. It means G string. We stay on the G string all the way until the second measure of the second line. And there you see a Roman numeral number three. That means we go to the D string there. Um, so remind yourself occasionally, Roman numerals here do not mean position. They mean which string. So I'm going to demonstrate the first measure on the A string. I can get to the G string now, which is really good. Um, I'm not quite comfortable there yet. I can get there, 
but it's a little bit of a stretch, so I'm gonna demonstrate on the A string where I'm comfortable. So look down at the third measure of the third line. That's where Roman numeral two, and that's where the A string starts. Did you notice how I shifted? Let me show you again, more slowly. So it wasn't just my finger that was shifting. My whole hand shifted as a unit, even my thumb, and nothing in my left hand was pressing or squeezing. That would actually make it really hard to shift. And while I'm shifting, my shifting finger is just gliding lightly on top of the string, almost like playing a harmonic. It's not pressing into the string at all until we get close to the landing point, which in this case is really close because it's only a half step. Um, but even then, I'm not pressing all the way into the fingerboard. I'm only pressing as much as I need to to get a clear sound, which is surprisingly less than you might think. And did you notice what my other fingers were doing? Let me demonstrate again. Yep, my other fingers, especially my pinky, are always aimed at the A string, hopefully at the exact in-tune spot where they're supposed to land next. And just like we did with the finger doodles in episode one, we keep them relaxed, all the fingers relaxed and close to the string. Now, the second shift in the measure is not on the first finger, it's on the second finger. That's the first shift, here comes the second, sh second shift. It's a whole step down, back down to first position. And it's the same principle as going up. The shifting finger glides on the top of the string until you get close to the landing point. Because this is an exercise, we can and should take enough time with the shift so that we hear when we reach the target. No guesswork here. We want to hear what we're doing. And also keep in mind, after you finish the first measure, it's another shift to get to the next measure. And you want to hear that shift too. You don't want to jump, you don't want to hide the shift. The whole point of practicing shifting is that we want to listen to what we're actually doing so that we can fix things that need to be fixed, reinforce things that are good, and then eventually it can become automatic. Now, once we shift to the new position for the next measure, you can see we repeat this same pattern in every measure, going up the string six times before we go to the next string. Before you get too excited about there being a pattern, I gotta point out, yes, it's the fi same fingering in the same order for every measure, but it's not the same pattern of half steps and whole steps. Make sure you look at the key signature, which in this case right now is C major. In the first measure, we shifted up a half step, right? And after we shift up that same half step, half step to get to the second measure. Here's the second measure. There's the second measure. Now, once we're in the second measure, we start the pattern again. We shift up a whole step. And we shift down a whole step also, because that's what's in the key signature. I said C major, but actually it could be A minor too. It's no sharps, no flats, and there's not really a key here. Although the first measure on the A string sounds like it's going to be C major, but it really isn't. So we have to be sure we're reading the notes correctly, and we have to be sure we understand no matter what position we're in, what the exact interval is between every note. Now, just to complicate things even more, if you look just above 
exercise one at the two lines of teeny tiny measures. Those are examples of different key signatures. They've taken, in the first example, they give you one sharp and they print out two measures and then say, and then they wrote, etc., which means you're supposed to play the whole thing in that key signature. And then they write out all the key signatures in just one measure for all the rest, assuming you understand you're going to plug that key signature into the whole exercise. So once you're comfortable doing this with no sharps or flats, you're supposed to do it all over again in every key. This is actually a fabulous way to get comfortable with note reading in different positions. So try it. Try plugging in a different key signature every day. And let's play this now together. I'm going to do all six measures on the A string. No vibrato so that we're not cheating on the intonation. It's too tempting to, if you are landing just a weeny bit out of tune, it's too tempting to kind of vibrate it into tune, which isn't really in tune, and then you've not really practiced how to get it into tune. I like to play half a bar for each bow. If you wanna do a bow per beat, that's fine. I'm gonna set the metronome to 60, because that's a nice, comfortable, relaxed heartbeat tempo. And I'm going to play each measure twice. You can play both measures with me or you can listen to me the first time and join me on each repeat. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. sound like it should have had a B flat at the end? That's what I meant about don't expect this to sound like it's actually a, a real melody. Now you can do this on all four strings as written. And if any of you are panicking about reading the ledger lines when it goes high up on the E string, relax. There's actually a really good hack for that. So look at the second to last measure on the E string, it starts on D, it starts on that note. If you're looking at the ledger lines and thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know what notes those are. Remember I said it's the same pattern for every measure um, in terms of which fingers. It's not the same pattern for half steps and whole steps, but if you look for another measure in this exercise that starts with the note D, it's the same pattern of half steps and whole steps. So look at the last measure of the third line. It starts on the note D, it's all the same notes, just an octave lower. We, we already played it before, right? Play it again, think to yourself, where are the half steps, where are the whole steps? While you're at it, think what are the names of the notes? D, E, D, E, F, a, G, F, E, D. There's a half step between E and F. 
and then coming down, the half steps are between E and F. Now, find your D on the first finger on the E string. Make sure your hand is already in the position so your fourth finger can comfortably reach its notes. And while you're in that position, read the octave below. Easy peasy, right? One difference you might notice is the higher up you are in the E string, the closer your fingertips are going to be to each other. Um, because you're effectively, by pressing down on the string, you're creating a shorter vibrating length of the string. So that makes it kind of like a shorter string, almost like you're playing a smaller violin up there, and then you have to place your fingers closer together. So that's number one. Each one of these exercises emphasizes a specific shift or type of shift. If you look at exercise number two, that's what we call a substitution shift. You play a note with one finger, your whole hand shifts, and another finger takes over that note. So I'm going to demonstrate again on the A string. So my third finger was not the shifting finger. My second finger sneaked up as close to my third finger as it could get. And kind of pushed the third finger out of the way as my hand shifted with my second finger. Now we generally want with a substitution shift, we want the substituting finger to be close to the the finger it's taking over for. We don't want to we don't want to start from a whole step below, even though that's what's in the key signature at this point. It is too noisy that way. So that's substitution. Um, shifting. Exercise number three actually does the same thing, but you have a three, four, third finger to fourth finger substitution on the way down instead of a second finger to third finger as you do in number two. So here is exercise number three, just one measure of the A string. And with exercise number four, we have one of the most common types of shifts where the shifting finger is not the landing finger. With this one, you shift up with the first finger and you land on the fourth finger and you shift down on the fourth finger and land on the first finger. So let me demonstrate that one again on the A string. Now the thing with this one is you need to know exactly where your first finger is landing before your actual landing finger, the fourth finger, lands. And you probably need to practice the first finger landing on what is not a written pitch, but and in the final version you shouldn't actually hear that pitch. So I think of it as a ghost note. It's a note that really isn't there but you need to prepare your finger to play it, even though it doesn't get played, if that makes sense. Let me demonstrate again. My first finger is going to shift a half step to the note C. That's the ghost note. I'm not going to come down solidly on it, though. Did you hear how I did that? My fourth finger came down solidly. My first finger stayed kind of in harmonic mode, just lightly floating on top of the string, but it stopped in the right place. And then coming down, it's the fourth finger that's going to shift down. 
it's going to shift down half a step to the note E. In the next measure, my first finger shifted up a whole step. But you didn't hear it. And now my fourth finger is going to shift down a whole step. So you have to practice even though you don't really play those shifts, your, your left hand has to be doing them. You can also think of it this way. Both the shifting finger and the landing finger each actually have to have a target. So in this exercise, the first finger goes up one position in this key signature, no sharps, no flats. For the first measure, that's your half step going up for the first finger and half step going down for the first fourth finger. And in the second measure, first finger goes up a whole step, fourth finger comes down a whole step. So that's about it for today. For episode three, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite, scales. And if you enjoyed this video, you can click the subscribe button and then you'll be notified when episode three is published. And please click the like button and that helps the video be more visible in YouTube. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you in episode three.